So, what is it that we are going to talk about in this lecture? We are going to talk about this and this. That is, you get an object tied to a piece of thread. Like, for example, I've got this small mass here. It's a ball bearing. I've tied a piece of thread to it and then I've rotated that object in a horizontal circular path and in a vertical circular path. That is what we are going to talk about in this lecture. So, welcome. So, welcome to the third video on the overview of uniform circular motion. In this video, we are going to look at the applications of the concepts that you have already talked about in the first video and the second video. So, if you find that you can't follow along comfortably in this video, I would suggest that you look at the first two videos because they are very important for you to be able to understand what I'll be talking about in this video. So let's go straight to this video where I'm going to look at the calculations and how we go about calculations in uniform circular motion. So here we are, the third part of the overview of uniform circular motion. Let's go straight to the question. A body having a mass of 1.5 kilograms is tied to a string and uh, whirled in a horizontal circle of radius 2 meters with a uniform speed of 3.16 meters per second. We are asked to calculate the centripetal acceleration and the centripetal force. Now, I have underlined horizontal circle because in the next question, which is question number 9, we are going to look at vertical circle. So when I draw this circle like this, understand we are looking at this circular path from above so that this is the horizontal plane. This circle is in the horizontal plane. And this is what we mean by horizontal plane. Now, I want to use uh, this small mass here. I've tied a piece of thread to it. In fact, the small mass is a small ball bearing. Then I've tied that piece of thread like that. And then the length of the thread may be up to that point. So that is the length of the thread. If I rotate this ball bearing or that mass in that particular circle like that, the length of the string becomes equal to the radius of that circular path. Now this is a horizontal circle. Now what is a vertical circle? In a vertical circle, it will move like this. This is a vertical circle. So in a horizontal circle, I can also use this card to illustrate the same point. A horizontal circle means that the card is horizontal like that. So the circle is somewhere around here. So when I draw it on paper, you will imagine that you are looking at it from above. Okay? So that you can be able to get that concept in your mind. So this is a horizontal plane. The object or the mass will be moving in that plane. We call it horizontal circular path. When I hold the card like that, this is a vertical plane and the card or the object will be moving in this plane, in this plane here. That one will be a vertical circular path. You can imagine that you will be looking at the card like this so that now the circle will be here and this will be a vertical circle. So there will be a point the maximum point at this point and the lowest point will be here. Of course, there will be a point when the card, when the mass will be at the side here or at the side here. So that is a vertical circle. This is a horizontal circle. So over here, we are in the horizontal plane. So let me draw that circle again so that we can be able to follow along comfortably. They have got my beautiful circle. So the stone can be at any one point here or here. Any one point. 
the length of the string becomes equal to the radius of the circular path. path. So this radius is 2 meters. Of course, this is the mass and it is moving with uniform speed along this particular path like that. We have already derived the equation for centripetal acceleration. So centripetal acceleration is V squared over R. So we're going to get 3.16 square that and then divide by the radius which is 2. And this will give us 4.99 Because the units of acceleration is meters per second squared. Now let's look at part B. In part B, we want to calculate the centripetal force. So at this point, I want to mention that this centripetal force is provided by the tension in the string. So the tension is like that. Remember, we show tension in a string using two arrows, but depending on the object that we are interested in, for example, right now, I'm interested in the force which is acting on this mass. So this string pulls it in this direction. And you can see that force is towards the center of the circular path. So that tension must be equal to the centripetal force. So centripetal force is a resultant force. It is a resultant force which makes this object to accelerate. So from Newton's second law of motion, the resultant force, which of course is a vector, is equal to mass times the acceleration. And acceleration is also a vector. So this acceleration is towards the center of the circular path. So I can, let me just indicate here the acceleration is like this, using double arrow towards the center of the circular path. At this point, the double R will be pointing like that. And also the force is also pointing towards the center of the circular path. We have already discussed these concepts before. So the mass of this object is 1.5 kilograms and the acceleration has just been worked out as 4.99. And this will give us, actually the question which we have in our course book has a mass of 0 0.5 instead of 1.5. So let me use 1.5 times 4.99 and that actually gives me 7.485. We can round it up to 7.5 newtons. Can use two significant figures. So I had not noticed that I had uh, changed the mass of the object to be 1.5 instead of 0 0.5. However, the speed is still the same, 3.16 meters per second, and uh, the radius is 2. So this will be the centripetal force, and it will effectively be the tension in the string. Let's look at question 9. So over here, we are told that uh, a body having a mass of 1.5 kg is tied to a string and whirled in a vertical circle of radius 2 meters with a uniform speed of 5 meters per second. So the speed of the object along this vertical circle is uniform. But remember, the circle is vertical. We want to calculate the maximum tension in the string, the minimum tension in the string, and then we want to describe the variation of the tension with the position along the circular path. So there are three positions that I will be interested in. The first position is this one here. So we can call that position A. The second position is this one here. We can call that position B. And the third position is this one. We can call it position C. So let's start with position A. And of course it is at position A that the string will have maximum tension. 
So let's look at the forces which are acting on this object when it is at position A. One of the forces will be the weight of that object, mg. The other one will be the tension in the stream, T. Of course, since the tension is going to be different, I'm going to name this tension, tension A, T A. Tension when the object is at position A. And then I have to recall that this object is accelerating and its acceleration is towards the center of the circular path. Like that. So this is the direction of the acceleration towards the center of the circular path. That means there is a resultant force F which is also towards the center of the circular path. Because according to Newton's second law of motion, F is equal to MA, when a resultant force F acts on an object of mass M, it produces an acceleration A, and that acceleration is in the same direction as the resultant force. So the resultant force is the independent variable and the acceleration is the dependent variable. It is caused by the force. That is the first point I want you to get. Number two, I want you to remember this. Elsewhere in our course, we already know that if two forces act on an object and these forces are in opposite direction, then the resultant force on the object, number one, will be in the direction of the bigger force and is given by subtracting the smaller force from the bigger force. That's how we get the three newtons. You can compare this to this particular situation here where we've got an object and there are two forces acting on that object and they're acting in opposite direction. And then we know the direction of the resultant force. So, if I know the direction of the resultant force is this way, then I conclude that Ta is bigger than Mg. And in order to get the resultant force, I must subtract the force which is opposing the motion from this one. That is why I will get the resultant force here to be Ta minus Mg is equal to Ma. So Ta is equals to Ma plus Mg. And I want you to remember that A is a centripetal acceleration. And it is mv squared over r plus mg. That is how we get the tension in the stream. One point to remember is that if you're given this kind of problem where the object is being whirled in a vertical circle, maximum tension always occurs when the object is at the lowest point. And this is the point where the stream is likely to break. So we can substitute here by saying this is 1.5 times 5 squared, of course divided by 2 plus 1.5 times 10 and T A will be equal to, this is 18.75 plus 15, and that will give us 33.75. That is the tension in the string when the object is at position A. Let's see position C, because that is where we have already given the answer to part A. For part B, for us to be able to calculate the minimum tension in the string, that minimum tension will occur when the object is at position C. Why position C? Let's look at the forces which are acting on this object at position C. One of them is, of course, the weight of the object, which is mg. The other one will be the tension 
in the string when it is at position C that way. And we remember that the acceleration is towards the center of the circular path, which in this case happens to be downwards, and therefore the resultant force is also towards the center of the circular path on account of the fact that the acceleration is towards the center of the circular path. I hope you're getting this idea when I write F is equal to MA. And I'm putting these symbols here to, just to emphasize that these are vectors and that the direction of A is the same as the direction of F. So, again we go back to this body here. From the same topic, if you're given two forces and they're acting on a body and they're acting in the same direction, exactly same direction, then for you to get the resultant force, you just needed to add them and you get seven newtons. Just add them together. So that is similar to this situation here where TC and MG are acting in the same direction. So the resultant force will actually be TC plus MG is equals to MA. And it is at this point that I can get my TC being equal to MA. And then I subtract MG. This is MV squared over R minus mg and mv squared over r is 18.75 you know when I substitute these values just like before and this one is subtracting 15 cos 0. This is going to give me 3.75 newtons and that will be the tension in the string when the string is in that position so definitely you can see that although the speed is the same the tension in the string is not the same as when it was here here it is highest here it is minimum and of course average happens at position b why at position b at position B, our equation for centripetal force will not have mg because mg is vertically downwards while tension in the string is horizontal. The angle between the horizontal and the vertical is 90 degrees. The component of mg in this direction is zero. Therefore, it does not contribute to the centripetal force. So at position B, the only force which provides centripetal force is TB. It's going to be equal to mv squared over r. And of course, mv squared over r, we have already seen it is 18.75 newtons. So understand, maximum tension happens here, minimum tension happens here. And of course, average tension occurs there. So you can see that the tension is changing. If we start with it being least at this point, and of course I want you to realize that this point is the same as this point. It's only that the direction of that resultant force will be different. Here it is to the left, here it is to the right, but it's got the same magnitude of 18.75. So here the tension will be 18.75 newtons and here also 18.75 newtons. So if we can start from this point where the tension is 3.75 that tension is going to increase continuously increase because at some point here the weight of the object will have a component in this direction and therefore added to the tension you find that it's going to increase. The tension is going to increase until it's got a value of 18.75. Then it goes beyond 18.75. It has maximum value of 
33.75 at this point and then it start decreasing back to 18.75 then from 18.75 back to 3.75 so can we be able to plot a simple sketch showing how the tension varies with position let's do exactly that but in order to do that i've got to create some space here and then i draw that axis here and then we see how that force is going to change so remember this is 3.75 18.75 so our positions are the same position a position b and position c we were able to see that the tension here is 33.75 newtons position here the tension at point b is 18.75 newtons tension when the object is at point c is 3.75 newtons and of course here again the tension is 18.75 newtons so i want to draw this graph here so let me draw the y-axis which will cause show the tension in the string and because that tension doesn't become negative so i'm going to go all the way to the bottom part here and here i'm going to have this is going to be the position position i want to start with the um, position a here that's when it has maximum tension position a And then I'll come to position B at this point here, position B. Then I'll go to position C. Then I'll go to some position here, position D. Position D and I'll come back to position A when the object has made a complete cycle like that. So position A is uh, the highest tension, so it is here. Position B is average tension, it is somewhere around here. And remember that is the same tension that position D has. So I just need to go horizontally and show that position D has the same tension as position B. And then position C has the least tension of 3.75 here. And of course I can go back to position A with maximum tension. There. And the object has made a complete cycle. So I'm going to draw a smooth curve. You know, something like that. not so smooth but it can do that is how the tension varies with the position like that and that kind of motion is repeated some kind of a cosine curve like that so this is how we would describe the variation of the tension with position that's how it changes it is not the same but in question 8 where it was a horizontal circle then the tension was the same throughout in the next question i'm going to look at a situation whereby we are hauling water we have some water in a bucket and then we are hauling that water in a vertical circle we want to look at the conditions that must be fulfilled for the water not to pour out of the bucket at the highest position of the vertical circle. 